Hi Year 4, Mrs Price here. I'm going to be doing your reading lesson with you today. Okay, so today we're carrying on with our retrieval skill and our learning objective is to retrieve and record information from a non-fiction text. So last lesson, Mrs Evans left you with this think question. Do you think it's a good idea to live near a river? What ideas did you come up with? Well, I think it would be a good idea because it would be lovely to walk along the river and see the swans and the ducks. Or, on the other hand, you may think it wouldn't be a good idea because river, the river may flood and your home may get damaged. So if we have a look at our tricky words today, if we read these, we've got machinery, generate and canoeing. Now, can you see the root word in the word useful? That's right, it's use with the full suffix. That's been added to turn it into an adjective. We have a look at our word, our spelling word from our year three and four word list today. It's special. If we break it up, we've got the sp, e, eh, and then the tricky bit in the middle, the sh. All. Can you have a go? Pause the video and have a go at practicing the word special. Can you look, cover, write, and then give it a check? Off you go. So, if we have a look at our vocabulary for today, we can see we've got the word deposits, highway, and industry. Okay, so deposits are something that is left behind. And as the river moves, some bits are left behind and these are the deposits here. Okay, then we've got highway. So a highway is a route for vehicles to travel along. along. And very often a highway is a big road. Okay. And then the last one, industry. Okay, we've got pictures here of a factory. So an industry is the factories and companies that make one particular thing. Okay, can we have a go at saying these together? Deposits, highway, industry. Okay, can we clap them? Deposit, highway, industry. Okay. And we whisper them. Well done. So our text today is all about why people live near rivers. I'm going to read the text and I'd like you to follow as I read or you may join in if you like. Why live near rivers? People can use the water for drinking and washing. Farmers can water their crops or provide water for their farm animals to drink. Crops grow well on the rich soils of river flood plains. These soils are built up from layers of river mud, which the river deposits along its banks in times of flood. Fast flowing rivers can be used to drive machinery or generate electricity. Rivers are water highways, useful for transporting goods and people. People use rivers in their leisure time for activities such as canoeing and fishing. At the mouth of some rivers, sheltered deep water sites make ideal ports or harbours for fishing, trade or industry. Okay, so let's have a look at this first question together. It's a my turn, so listen carefully as I go through retrieving the answer to the question. Where do crops grow well? Okay, it's a where question, which means I need to look for a place. What's the key words in the question? What are those key words? We've got crops and we've got Row. Okay, well done. 
So I'm going to use my scanning skills to find those key words in the text. OK, so I'm looking for crops and grow. Scanning, scanning, going over the text. Oh, there's crops. Oh, there's crops grow well. Ah, so where do crops grow well? Okay, it's asking me where, and it says crops grow well on the rich soils of river floodplains. Okay. So once you've found those key words, crops and grow, read around those words for the more information. So the place is river floodplains. That's where the crops grow. And if we have a look on the check page, you can see that I have highlighted the key words and the answers here. So the key words were where and crops grow well. And then we've got crops grow well, rich soils of river floodplains. Okay. OK, so now it's an hour turn. If we read the question, it says name two activities people like to do on rivers in their leisure time. OK, so what are the important key words that we need to scan the text for here? OK, it's activities and it's leisure time. So now let's read around those key words and see if we can find the answer to the question. So activities and leisure time. Let's have a look and see if we can find them. Leisure time, activities. OK, so let's read this sentence then. People use rivers in their leisure time for activities such as canoeing and fishing. OK. So there's the answer to that question. The two activities are canoeing and fishing. And if we have a look on the check page, we can see that I've highlighted those key words in the question. And I found them here in the text. And reading around those key words, we can see that it's canoeing and fishing. Now it's a your turn question and the first question is a retrieval question. What is a waterway? But the second question, I want you to use your understanding of the text to think about the answer to the second question. It's a why question. So why do you think it is called this? Okay, so why is it called a water highway? So pause the video now and have a go at this question. OK, so how did you get on at those questions? Let's have a look at the check page. OK, so the key words that we were looking for in the question were water, highway. OK. So if you look, what is a water highway? It says here that rivers are water highways. Okay. Okay, so why do you think it is called this? Chili two and threes, I hope you've come up with some really good ideas. Now, if we think about the word highway, it's one of our vocabulary words, we know it's a road. A river is like a watery road because it, people and things can travel up and down it. It says here about transporting goods and people. Okay, so we're going to end today's lesson with another think question. And this question is, would you like to live near a river? Why or why not? Okay, so have a little think about that. Can you
you jot your ideas down in your book and use all of your knowledge of rivers that you've learned so far to help you come up with some of your own ideas. Off you go. Okay, so today we're up to chapter 10 of our book and it's called War and Missing Pieces. On the day after the big fight, just as Tom had guessed, Arnott became famous. In the playground, wherever he went, people pointed and gasped and called him the boy who beat Brendan the bully. And they asked him lots of questions like, is it true you can do a hundred punches in under a minute? And what were you really fighting over? Was it your parents' ransom money? And when are you going to fight him again? Can we come and watch? After a while, Miss Hemsey began to tell everyone to leave Armet alone. So everyone started asking Michael and Josie and me their questions instead. I didn't say much and neither did Michael. But Josie and Tom got so excited that they started to add new bits to the story. So that by the end of the week, most of the school believed Armet hadn't just beaten up Brendan the bully, but had fought Chris and Liam too over a suitcase full of red diamonds and a pink basketball. All this made Brendan the bully scowl more than ever. But even though he stared at us all the time and Chris and Liam showed us their fists whenever they saw us, they didn't chase us around the playground or steal Josie's football or smash into us when we were carrying our lunch trays like we thought they would. I bet he's scared of us now that we've got Armet, grinned Tom. Yeah, said Josie, he's a proper scaredy cat now. But Michael said he didn't like it one little bit and that he bet Brendan the bully was up to something. At first I didn't believe him, but then lots of strange things began to happen to Armet. The first thing happened just two days after the big fight. We'd all been decorating a new pot for our photosynthesis plants and Mrs Khan had given Armet a golden star because his plants had grown faster than anyone else's. I think that was because every morning before Mrs Khan called the register, he would water it and talk to it for one whole minute. I didn't know that plants could speak different languages, but when I asked Mrs Khan about it, she said plants could speak every language under the sun and that the more languages they heard, the faster they grew. Ahmet was really proud of his golden star and he got a silver one too for decorating his pot with pictures of seashells and whales and fish. But when we got back from last break that afternoon, his pot was lying broken on the floor and his plant had been stamped on. Somebody must have smashed it on purpose because nobody else's plant pots were hurt at all. Mrs Khan said that if the person who did it didn't put their hand up right away, they would be in big trouble. But nobody did put their hands up, so the mystery of the murdered plant pot stayed a mystery. Then, almost exactly a week after the mystery of the murdered plant pot, came the day of the deathly worm tray. After assembly one morning, Mrs Khan told us all to get our work workbooks from our class trays. But when Ahmet pulled his open, he found it bursting with a whole pile of large, fat, wriggling worms. He cried out and dropped the tray on the floor so that all the worms were flying out across the room. That made Dean, who sits on the table behind me, be sick all over his table. Dean is scared of anything that doesn't have any legs on it, even snails, but he hates worms the worst. Mr Whittaker, the school cleaner, had to come and clean it all up and Mrs Khan and Miss Hemsey were very angry and checked all our trays. But no one else had a single worm in their tray, not even Tony the nose picker, and he likes to collect all kinds of strange things in his tray. Mrs Khan told the person who had done it to put their hand up again, and this time she looked at Brendan the bully as if she wasn't really speaking to any of us, but only at him. But again, nobody put their hand up. So Mrs Khan shook her head and said that she was going to make sure that whoever it was would be caught soon and punished, not just by her, but by Mrs Sanders too. And then after that came the worst trick of all, the one that everyone in school later called the Great Baked Beans Bag Trap. Every morning, right, right, right before Mrs Khan takes the register, 
everyone has to put their school bag on their own special hook at the back of the class. And we're only allowed to take our PE kit or homework or lunch boxes out when we're told to. Everyone knows whose bag is where because everyone's hook has their name on top. Just days after the day of the deathly worm tray. Mrs Khan told us to get up and collect our PE kits from our bags, just like she always did on Wednesdays. But when Armit went to get his PE kit and unzipped his rucksack, a lumpy river of baked beans burst out and splodged and splashed all over him. Everyone cried out, Ugh! and then instantly fell silent. Mrs Khan was so angry when no one put their hands up she, that she cancelled PE and Mrs Sanders came and told the whole class off. It was horrible, especially because Armit started to cry when he saw what had happened to his PE kit and his bag. I think everyone knew it was Brendan the bully who had done all these things, but no one could prove it. Not even Mrs Khan. After that day, the door to the classroom was locked every break time and at lunchtime, which stopped anything else from happening to Armit's things. But I wanted more than anything for Brendan the bully to be caught and to prove he was a criminal. So Michael brought his granddad's magnifying glass in and we all searched for clues. But we couldn't find a single one, not even in the school bins. Ahmet was more upset about the great baked beans bag trap than any of the other things that had happened. And even though Miss Hemsey washed his rucksack with lots of washing up liquid, it looked even worse than before and it smelled strange too. But Armit still brought it into school with him every day. I wanted to know why he didn't get a new one or why Miss Hemsey kept saying that it looked fine when it didn't. And then just two days after the great baked beans bag trap, I found out. We'd all put away our books and were getting ready for group story time, just like we always did on a Friday, when Mrs Khan made a surprise announcement. Now everyone, she said, this is our last afternoon before we all break up for the half term holidays and I thought we could all do with a treat. Instead of us all reading a story together, we're going to listen to one instead. And it's a very important story because it's going to be told to us by someone very special in our class. Looking over at Armit and Miss Hemsey, she waved them over to where she was standing. I didn't know it just then, but I was about to have nearly all of my original 11 questions answered in one go. We all turned around to watch as Miss Hemsey picked up a large pile of papers from the table and followed Armit to the front of the class. I want everyone to listen extra carefully and I don't want anyone asking any questions until after Armit has finished telling his story. Is that understood? Yes, Mrs Khan, shouted the class. Good, and leaning against her desk, Mrs Khan smiled and said, Armit. Everyone shuffled in their chairs and sat up straight waiting for Armit to speak. I wondered if he would tell the story in English or in Kurdish but I was so excited that I really didn't mind. Hello, my name is Armit. I am nine years old and I am a refugee. I come from Syria. As he said this, he pointed to Miss Hemsey, who held up a drawing showing a house and a tree and a car in front of some mountains. And in the front of the car were four people labelled me, mum, dad and sister and a cat. I was surprised because I had never thought about Armit having a brother or a sister. I thought he was like me and didn't have any. His sister wasn't at our school. In the picture she looked smaller than him so maybe she was in nursery. But in Syria there is big war, said Armit, and he pointed to Miss Hemsey again who held up another picture. This one showed buildings on fire and bombs dropping from a plane and lots of people lying on the ground and other people holding guns. Josie stopped chewing her hair and looked at me and then looked back at the drawing again. And from behind I heard someone whisper, whoa, he's seen a real bomb and a real gun. Because of war, my family run away, said Armit. 
as his lion eyes became big and round and watery. We went on mountains and rivers and carry bags and cat. This time Miss Hemsey held up a picture showing a family crossing mountains and rivers and in the sky birds that were crying. In the picture Armit had drawn himself carrying a red rucksack with a black stripe on it just like the one he had now. That was when I knew why he loved it so much and why he cried when it had been filled with Brendan the Bully's horrible baked beans. He had carried it all the way from his house and over a mountain, which meant it was lots more important and lots more special than any of our bags. Then nowhere safe, so we get on boat on Big Sea. This time Miss Hemsey held up a drawing of a boat. But the boat wasn't like a normal boat with sails and pointy ends and wooden sides. This one was flat and round and was orange on the sides, just like the ones I'd seen on the news that didn't have any toilets on them. And inside the people, inside the boat, there were lots of people all wearing vests that made them look like puffin birds. But there were people in the water too, and they had bubbles coming in their mouth, out of their mouth saying, help me. Everyone leaned forward in their chairs and tried to read the labels that Armit had put over some of the people's heads. I saw me and mum and dad, but there wasn't one for sister or cat. I know cats don't like water because Josie has a cat and she says it screams whenever it rains and always wants to stay inside. So maybe Armit's cat didn't want to get into the boat. And maybe his sister didn't want to leave it behind, so she stayed behind to look after it. Then we are in another country called Greece, said Armit. We live in tent with lots of people who run away like me. They come from lots of countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan. The next picture showed a flag with a blue and white stripes and a white cross in the blue corner. And next to it were lots of tents and people everywhere sitting next to fires and sleeping on the floor. In this picture, only the words me and dad could be seen. Ahmet's mum must be sleeping inside one of the tents. Then we walk long time in lots of country. It was cold and we sleep on floor and then we stay in France. This time Armit pointed to the next picture with his finger and showed us the railway tracks that he had drawn. On it were people carrying suitcases and children and all of them were walking to a wall with barbed wire on the top. Everyone looked sad and in the corner there were army tanks and soldiers holding guns and all the guns were pointing at the people with their suitcases and children. Miss Hemsey held this drawing up for longer than any of the others because Armit was looking at it and didn't seem to want to stop staring at it. Then I come here and come to school. I like here, no bombs. It's safe and I like new friends and teacher and play football. Armit stood and stared at everyone and everyone stared back. Mrs. Khan blew her no nose loudly and Miss Hemsey put the drawings down and gave Armit a hug. Thank you, Armit, said Mrs. Khan, standing up and putting her hand on his shoulder. Everyone, let's give Armit a huge round of applause for being so brave and for sharing his story with us. We all clapped, but we didn't clap as loud as we usually do for stories because I think we were feeling a little bit strange. I don't think any of us had ever heard a story like it before. And as sad and scary as it was, it was even sadder and scarier because it wasn't just a made up story from one of our reading books. It was all real. Armit had survived everything his pictures had shown us and was here with us. Knowing that made me feel sorry and proud and scared for him all at once. But most of all, it made me want to tell him he was definitely the bravest person I knew. Now, as you have seen, Armit's story is very special and I'm sure you have lots of questions you'd like to ask him, said Mrs. Carm. Everyone's hands immediately shot up into the air. 
but I think mine was first. That's wonderful, smiled Mrs Khan as she signalled at us to put our hands back down. But as Arma is still learning his English words, we're only going to ask him three questions. I want you all to write down just one question for him on a piece of paper. Mrs Khan walked around and gave us each a thin slip of blank paper. And when you're done, Miss Hemsey is going to pick out three questions she can ask him. You have a few minutes to think of your question and to write it out in your very best handwriting. Try to get all your spellings right and remember just one question each. The entire class fell quiet as everyone grabbed their pencils, put their heads down and wrote out their questions. I had lots of questions that I wanted to ask, but I picked the one that was most new and wrote that one out. After a few minutes, Mrs Khan said our time was up and Miss Hemsey collected all the bits of paper. Everyone began to whisper to one another as Mrs Khan and Miss Hemsey looked through our questions and either shook their heads or nodded. What did you ask? whispered Tom, turning around. I asked why he didn't stay in Greece because the weather's warmer there and they have more seaside places, whispered back Josie. Oh, and I asked how fast he had to run away to get away from the bombs, whispered Tom. Michael, what did you ask? whispered Josie, leaning forward and poking Michael on the shoulder. I asked if it was scary to be in the boat and if he was on it at night time, said Michael. That's two questions, whispered Josie, shaking her head. And then she looked at me. What did you ask? I asked what happened to his cat and what his sister's name is, I answered. Oh, said Tom, but that's two questions as well. Right, everyone, said Mrs Khan, clapping her hands together so that we all stopped whispering and looked to the front of the class. We have had some excellent questions here, but we've chosen three. I'm going to say them in English and then Miss Hemsey is going to translate both the question and the answer for us. Right, the first question is, what did your mum and dad do in Syria? Miss Hemsey spoke to Arma in Kurdish and he said something back. Miss Hemsey nodded and then looking at us, he said, Armit's father was a teacher and his mother wrote for a newspaper. Everyone in class nodded and we waited for Mrs Khan to read out the next question. I crossed my fingers extra tight in the hope that it would be mine. The next question is, what did you like doing most before the war happened? We waited for Miss Hemsey to tell Armit what the question was and then reply, he liked to play football with his friends, answered Miss Hemsey, and I'm going to the park with his grandfather and eating kibber. She smiled at Armit, and before any of us could ask what a kibber was, explained that a kibber is a very special snack, which is filled with minced meat in the middle and is covered with lots of delicious spices. It's very famous in Syria, and it looks like... Miss Hemsey went over to the blackboard and quickly drew a shape. It looked like a small American football. Is that the right shape, Armit? she asked. Armit nodded. We all looked at each other and tried to imagine what an American football with mincemeat in the middle might taste like. As Mrs Khan held up the last slip of paper, I decided to cross both my fingers and my toes. But it didn't work because then she said, and the last question is, do you still sleep in a tent or do you sleep in a house now? When Armit heard this question from Miss Hemsey, he shook his head and said something. No, he sleeps in a house now, said Miss Hemsey, and he is happy because there is a toilet in it and hot water and food. And as we all nodded to each other, Mrs Khan put her arm around Armit and said, let's give Armit another round of applause, shall we? This time, nearly everyone clapped much louder than before, and Michael even cried out, woohoo! as Armit and Miss Hemsey went and sat back down. But I could see that Brendan the bully was mouthing boo and making faces as if something smelled and Liam gave him a double thumbs down. I looked back at Mrs Khan and Miss Hemsey hoping they had seen two but they were too busy looking at Armit. Right, now everyone before we leave today I want you all to listen to me very carefully. Mrs Khan clapped her hands once and waited for everyone to settle back down. 
As I said, you all had some fantastic questions for Armit, and I'm very proud of you for thinking up such interesting and thoughtful ones. But, and here she looked at us with her eyebrows raised, which meant she was being extremely serious and would be extra angry if we didn't listen to her. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that running away from a war and leaving your home is a very hard thing to do. And it's especially hard when you have to try and put all the missing pieces of your life back together again in a place that's new and strange to you. Then Mrs Khan quickly glanced at me and Josie and Michael and Tom and said, I know that some of you miss Armit when he's not allowed to go out and play. And I know you all have lots of questions for him. But it's very important that he talks to people who know what he's been through and who can help him feel better. And it's even more important that they can ask him the kinds of questions that you all want to ask him in a safe and secluded place first, before he's ready to speak to other people more. Okay? Josie looked over at me and I looked over at her and Tom and Michael looked over their shoulders at us. So that was what the seclusion was for. It was so that Armit could talk to people. So, continued Mrs Khan, I want you all to promise me that you won't ask Armit any more questions about the war or about his family without asking me or Miss Hemsey first. Is that understood? Yes, Mrs Khan, said the class as the bell for home time began to ring. Good. Now, row one, put away your things and off you go. Make sure you all have everything you need for your homework assignments for the half term and I'll see you in a week's time. As we waited for our row to be called out, I looked over my shoulder at Armit and wondered what pieces he was still missing before he could put his life back together again. It was like a jigsaw. I thought, I hate doing jigsaws, even the easy ones, because I always get bored halfway through and I couldn't imagine trying to do ones that have pieces missing. I sure hoped that when he was running away from all the bullies and the bombs, Armit hadn't lost any of the important pieces on the way, and that if he had, someone was helping him find new ones that were exactly the right shape and colours that he needed. Okay.